I'm not going to begin with a story. I'm going to begin with David. David tells its own type of story, right? I also refuse to stand on these red circles. <laughs> the price of education, particularly higher education, is completely, possibly immorally out of control. Right? Over the last 35 years, you can see the bottom line, the average hourly wage, has increased about 350%, while the top line, college tuition fees, has grown over 1100%. Uh, last year, this graph gained some popularity, uh, or at least some notoriety, maybe it wasn't popular, comparing median income for someone who holds a bachelor's degree with the total amount of student loan debt outstanding. And last year, outstanding student loan debt in the United States passed a trillion dollars. And student loan debt is important uh, and different from other types of debt for the reason that it can't be discharged in bankruptcy. Your credit card debt can go away, your mortgage debt can go away, but there's legally no mechanism for getting rid of your student loan debt. This puts incredible financial pressures on the students in the system and the families who support them. And changes in tuition uh, are hugely political and very complicated. It involves the legislature, it involves the Board of Regents. And it's terribly difficult to pull off. To get everyone that needs to agree to agree to making the kinds of changes that need to be made. However, if you look at the second line from the top in this diagram, this is the price of textbooks, which has grown over 800% in that same time period. According to the College Board, the average student last year spent about $1,200 just on textbooks. And depending on what kind of program you're in, particularly if you're at a two-year school, uh, say like Cerritos College in California, uh, you might pay more in textbooks than you do in tuition in a year to attend school in an associate's degree type of program. Now, there have been a number of surveys done on this topic. Um, yeah, I love her face. Her face characterizes all of our feelings. <laughs> textbooks generally, let alone their prices. Um, but 60% of students, according to a uh, Florida virtual survey, 60% of students sometimes skip buying textbooks because they're too expensive. And almost a quarter of students regularly skip buying the required materials that they need to read to support their learning. You can imagine being a professor walking into class knowing that one-fourth of your students not only didn't read, it was impossible for them to read. They had no opportunity to read before they came to class. And this is one way of thinking about the complete unethical insanity of textbook prices. For about $8 a month, you can get streaming access to essentially every movie ever made. For about $8 a month, you can get that same access to every song ever recorded. For a similar price, you can uh, get TV shows, almost every TV show ever made. And for about the same amount of money, for which you can rent a month's access to every TV show, every movie, and every song ever recorded, you can rent a biology textbook. <laughs> well, fortunately, textbook changes are significantly easier to engineer. Textbook selection isn't controlled by the legislature. It's not controlled by the state board. It's controlled by individual faculty members, sometimes by departments. But it's low, and it's a very simple thing to move. It's relatively straightforward. But if you're going to move, if you're going to try to do something with textbooks to eat away, to chip away at this financial pressure that students and families feel, what would you do? I, I want to recommend open educational resources as an alternative to think about in place of traditional textbooks. Now, we all know what educational resources are. Educational resources are textbooks, their syllabi, their videos, their lesson plans, their assessments and test item banks and things like that. But what does open mean in this context? Open means two very specific things. Open means these materials uh, provide me with free and unfettered access. Not only do I not have to pay, but I don't have to give away my email address. I don't have to give up my zip code. There is literally no technological barrier between me and the resource. And in addition to free and unfettered access, I also get uh, permission to engage in what we call the 5R activities. These being retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So I can make and own and keep forever a copy of that resource. 
I can use it in a wide range of ways. I can make changes to it. I can take another one and mix them up, create a mashup, create a remix to produce something new. And I can take that new thing, or take the verbatim thing, the way I found it originally, and make additional copies of it and give them away to other people. The idea of the five odd permissions is that uh, these Creative Commons licenses, which I hope you've heard of Creative Commons. If you haven't, I'll show you that you actually have. You just didn't know that you had. These Creative Commons licenses are a copyright license that instead of saying, all rights reserved, hands off, here's the list of things you cannot do, the Creative Commons licenses are copyright licenses that tell you, here are all the permissions that you have. And that set of permissions is these 5R permissions. Um, Google, Yahoo, main, major search engines track the number of resources online that use these open licenses. And at last count, there are a little over half a billion resources on the web that use one of these open licenses that give you permission to download and make and keep a copy, to make changes, to give copies away to your friends. Completely legally, we're not talking about illegal file sharing. We're talking about a case where the user, the author of the book, the creator of a piece of software says, no, I want to make this open source. I want to put it out in the world where everyone can use it, copy it, download it, change it, trade it, and do that all legally. Now, we're not talking about MOOCs here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of MOOCs, but uh, in the recent two or three years, there's been a bunch of hype around these large online courses which are free to register and take. They're free, but they're not open. And in fact, not only do they not grant you the 5R permissions, and not only do they require you to give up a certain amount of personal information to access them, they're actually more strongly copyrighted than, say, material on the New York Times or at National Geographic. Uh, this is a quote from the terms of use of the Coursera website. Coursera is one of the more popular review providers. And you'll see not only does it not give you permission to download it and use it and do things with it, it also prohibits you from using it in conjunction with an actual class that you're taking. So the MOOCs definitely aren't what we're talking about. They're not open. We are talking about things like MIT's Open Courseware program, uh, things like the Khan Academy, which I assume many of you are familiar with, uh, the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon. These are all programs, whether MIT or at Carnegie Mellon or uh, the others that I'll show you, where these schools take materials from their courses, they take videos, they take books, they take readings, they put a Creative Commons license on them to grant you free and unfettered access and these 5R permissions. OpenStax is a new nonprofit publisher of textbooks that makes all of their textbooks available completely free online for you to download, change, remix, use in your classroom. And if you want to buy a printed copy, you can do that for a very reasonable price from them. CK12 is a foundation that focuses on uh, middle and high school textbooks in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, and math. FET from the University of Colorado a series of simulations in the science areas designed by literally a Nobel Prize winner. Again, Creative Commons license, freely available for you to download and use in supporting your own informal learning, to use in your K-12 classroom, at your university, wherever. Uh, we've been involved for a number of years now uh, with a project here in Utah. I'll talk a little bit about it in, in a minute. Taking open educational resources from around the web and supporting teachers in the process of pulling those together to create textbook replacements that are specifically aligned with Utah's Science Corps and don't contain any cruft that was thrown into books by big publishers for Florida or Texas or somebody else, and that are completely free and open have all those five R permissions I talked about a minute ago for you to use online, or schools can buy them print on demand. You can see here through the Amazon print on demand service create space for less than $6 a book compared to the 90 or 100 dollars that they might have paid for a science textbook previously. Even the TED Talks, you'll see at the bottom here on TED's uh, usage policy page, the TED Talks use Creative Commons licenses. That what's, that's what makes it possible for you to download them and share them with friends and, and do things like that. So many people will say, okay, you beat me over the head with a dozen examples, that's great. I admit it, there is a bunch of free stuff available on the internet, and you've even given me permission to tinker with it, great. But everybody knows that you get what you pay for. So why would I walk away from my $100 book in the K-12 classroom? Or why would I walk away from my $215 book in Intro to Psychology for a bunch of free stuff? Because 
You get what you pay for. We all have learned that from, from a very young age. So I want to tell two stories very quickly um, about open educational resources in the classroom. Mercy College is a college in New York. Um, uh, we recently undertook a project with them to help them move their developmental math courses away from uh, a commercial textbook and a product called My Math Lab where students log in and do homework and it automatically generates problems and grades the problems and provides them feedback. Which is about a $170 bundle together that book plus the software and help them move to open educational resources and a tool called My Open Math, which is an open source tool very similar to uh, My Math Lab, which they could have run themselves for free and it wouldn't have cost them anything. Uh, either way, it didn't cost students anything, but the college paid us $3 per student, as opposed to the 170 that the students were paying before, just to provide the hosting and the maintenance and do the technical piece of it for them. But it's open source and they could have done it themselves. Uh, in spring 2011, before they introduced any open educational resources into this class, we were still using the $170 bundle, 48% of students were completing that class with a C or better. In spring of 2012, they switched a couple of sections as a pilot to this open model, and in 13, they flipped all, I think it was 26 sections of developmental math to the open system and grew the pass rate to uh, slightly over 60%. Now, I, I think this is really fascinating and interesting because I really like to think about this idea of the golden ratio. What, what kind of success are we getting, student success per dollar spent, as we think about whether we license this piece of software or that piece of software, do we use this textbook or that textbook? Um, and if you think about 48% passing divided by $170 required spend for every student versus 60% passing and a $3 spend for every student, you're looking at you know, 0.28 students succeeding per dollar versus 20% of students succeeding per dollar, which is about 100x improvement in efficiency. Uh, the second story I'll tell, uh, this was the big project that we worked on last year. It was a Tidewater Community College in Virginia. Tidewater is one of the biggest community colleges in the country, 45,000 students, more than a dozen campuses around Virginia. And their associate's degree in business is their most popular, uh, one of their most popular programs. Uh, we worked with them over about a nine month period to move that entire degree program off of commercial textbooks and onto open educational resources. So that starting in the fall of 2013, starting this past fall, it's now possible for you to complete every course in that program and graduate without ever buying a textbook. Because there are faculty who have chosen to use, for every course you're required to take and every elective course, have chosen to use open educational resources instead of commercial textbooks. And I'll show a different version, a different success metric here uh, than students completing with a C or better. This percentage of students dropping before the ad drop date. So you can see, Previously, there were about 8% of students who were dropping, and in the Z sections now, what they call the Z degree, the zero textbook cost degree, uh, and these are both numbers for fall 2013. Not every faculty member is using OER, only a few members are. So this is a comparison of students from last fall in the same classes. Some had teachers that were using OER, some had teachers that were using traditional textbooks. In the traditional textbook sections, over 8% of students dropped. In the Z degree sections, uh, over, just over 2% of students dropped. And that's important for a wide range of reasons. It's important to students, among other things, because when you drop a class, it slows you down. It means you've got to come back and you've got to take that class again. Or you have to pay tuition again, and that's going to be another semester before you graduate. But as an institution, when you have a student that drops before the drop ad date, you've provided a bunch of service to them, but you still have to refund their tuition now, or at least a portion of their tuition. So not only did this adoption choice make it significantly less expensive for students because now they don't pay anything for textbooks on their way through, and it's keeping them on track for graduation, but the institution actually keeps more tuition dollars than they did before they made the change in the past. Um, I said I'd say something very quickly, I will, because we're just about out of time, about our work here in Utah. Uh, we've just finished up a major study that's been accepted for publication showing that across several thousand students who used open science textbooks uh, in middle and high school courses here in Utah, that those students performed either the same or in some cases better than uh, students who use traditional textbooks on the state's own standardized test, the end of year test, 
that policy decisions and funding decisions are made on. So instead of uh, you know, spreading out a $90 textbook spend across a seven-year replacement cycle, which is something like 11 and a half or $12 a year, now schools are spending more in the neighborhood of 5 or $6 a year and getting the same, or in some cases, better results. So I think oh, this idea of open educational resources relieves some of the pressure. Obviously, it doesn't relieve all the pressure. We can't take this approach to deal with uh, tuition. But you can use open educational resources to dramatically improve uh, a number of student outcomes, whether it's the drop, uh, the drop rate, the withdrawal rate, the percentage of complete with year better. And you can drastically recall, reduce the cost uh, of school for students. Uh, I spent 14 years as an educational technology professor, first at Utah State and then at BYU. And one of the things I've always been just super frustrated by is this idea that we're right on the edge. We're just about to have this breakthrough. Several years ago, we were just about to have a breakthrough with uh, interactive video discs. Before that, TV was going to be a huge breakthrough. Before that, it was radio. Then it was the internet. Now, computers in every classroom, we're, we're just on the edge. We're almost there. Um, that kind of talk has been going on in our field for 25 years, and it makes me more crazy. Um, this idea of using open educational resources to dramatically reduce cost and improve success is not something that's almost here. It's here right now. We're doing it right now. Just not enough people know about it and not enough people are engaging in it. So I say to you that only you can advocate for open educational resources at your kid's school, whether your kid's school is the high school or the elementary or the college they're going to, or with your faculty if you're taking classes. Uh, you know, this approach isn't spreading because Pearson and McGraw-Hill and others don't have sales reps out telling faculty, hey, you can do this. They're out trying to sell textbooks. This is very much a word of mouth uh, type of work. So I'd encourage you, please, uh, for the students in your life and the teachers that you know and the member of the school board that lives next to you, let them know about this approach. Thank you very much.